Eric Keller here, Enthusiast Auto. We are just finishing up a fantastic week in South Carolina. Uh, the, reportedly the last Oktoberfest uh, for the BMW Car Club. Uh, yet the 50th anniversary of the car club, right? Yep. And uh, we are driving a 1981 BMW M1. And when I say we, we're with a BMW uh, motorsport legend in the enthusiast world, Eric Wensberg. And uh, we are driving to a, uh, a Haggerty, um, I guess a panel, right? Where they want us to talk about valuations of vintage cars. Yeah, the uh, five cars to watch of uh, what's coming and going. And uh, I guess they think that we know a thing or two about classic cars. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit fun. So we're going to do this is what we call EAG Unscripted. We've done a couple of these where, where two buddies are just rapping about uh, the stuff that we both are passionate about. And so, um, you know, without further ado, um, you know, Eric has a very long history with motorsport, uh, which started when? Early 80s. And you were with who? I was with, uh, I was a consultant to Miller Brewing. I had done three years on the Men's Pro Tennis Tour, kind of learning about sports marketing, and I very quickly gravitated to motorsports. I grew up in a family of racers. My dad was a, a really devoted F1 fan, IndyCar fan, and Rather than talk, I grew up in the Boston area, so rather than talk about the Patriots and the Red Sox, we would sit around the dining room table talking about Sterling Moss and Dan Gurney. And in 1964, I was seven or eight years old. My parents went to Monaco, and my father did one of the last live TV commercials on ABC Wide World of Sports for Polaroid, the company he was working with. And they got Phil Hill in the pit lane um, with a Cooper Monaco, and he said, uh, Look, Phil, I got a camera and some film or 400 bucks. We're going to do a 60-second commercial. Which would you like? And he said, well, thought about it for two seconds. He said, I'll take the 400. <laughs> so I, I knew a lot about racing. I knew a lot of people in racing. I grew up going to vintage races. And um, Watkins Glen went to college in upstate New York. So I knew quite a bit about professional racing before I got there. But... In the early 80s, Miller Brewing was owned by Philip Morris, and they had just lost the right to advertise on television for cigarettes. They were very concerned with a campaign they had running with ex-sports personalities that talked about uh, Miller Lite and Miller High Life in very funny ways, and they were accused of uh, overtly marketing to uh, college kids and young people. And they were very worried they were going to be kicked off of television for beer advertising. So I walked into this agency and they asked to meet me. And they laid out their problem and they said, uh, we got a bunch of stick and ball guys. Uh, you guys know all about professional sports. We have a book full of properties that is three inches thick. And uh, we don't know anything about racing and we're 10 years behind Budweiser. And we need some help. We need a crash course in catching up with Budweiser. And I said, well, you just met the right guy. So for the next three years, we orchestrated a plan to invest in the best and put them under long-term contract. And we spent $20 million a year. Whoa. And my job was to go out there and to uh, find the best properties, interview the best teams, look at each market segment, every beer brand. And they would say, okay, Miller Lite, what should we be doing? And I'd say, drag racing, we do funny car, top fuel. We did the first jet on limited hydroplane. But the deals that I really am the most proud of are uh, Roger Penske and IndyCar. We did the biggest deal in car history in 1983. And then I did the Lowen Brow Special with Al Holbert in the winter of 83. I did that deal in three days. Wow. It was supposed to go to Bob Tullius in the factory Jaguar. And Jaguar wouldn't let us paint the car those colors. Can you believe yeah, it? Yeah, that was one of the best liveries ever, too. Bob wanted the deal so badly he could taste it, literally, and was crushed when they didn't get it. And I called Al in December and said, what are you doing next year? And he said, not much. I've got an IndyCar deal for the 500, and that's about it. I'll do a little Can-Am, maybe. So I said, can you get a 962? And he said, well... Our customers, Bob Aiken and uh, Bruce Levin and a few others, are ahead of me, but I can get one. 
And I said, well, okay, let's rent a 935. We'll go to Miami and just paint it low and brow colors. <laughs> and that car is for sale at, at Canapas out in California right now. It's a K3 that we rented from John Fitzpatrick. Yeah. So I had a deep history in American racing. And uh, I became the guy everybody wanted to have lunch with. <laughs> and so now you're uh, making your way to BMW at that point. I got was a, in 80... It was uh, in 84, early 85. Uh, but late 84, I got a call from McLaren. It was one of the teams we had interviewed. Uh, one of the teams we had interviewed for the IndyCar project. And they said, look, we're doing a huge sports car project, the biggest we've ever done. We're working with an imported car manufacturer, and uh, they really don't have anybody. And that wasn't exactly true. They had a fellow named Jim Patterson, um, who unfortunately was gravely ill with cancer at the time. So I came in and met with them. They had a lot of problems, um, a lot of people working in Detroit, and uh, it was way behind schedule. We were trying to use the 1.5 liter four cylinder turbocharged F1 engine. Which was a beast. Yes. So well, did, was it the story that that mid engine broke the dyno? Yes. <laughs> the, the, the dyno was rated for like 1500? Yes. And they, <laughs> they didn't, they couldn't tell how much horsepower they had. It, it especially was, qualifying. That was an M10 bottom end, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> we stroked it to 2.1 liters and it caused some real vibration which was a problem that we dealt with pretty much the whole time but I came uh, was a consultant for a year and then became an employee in the spring of 86 and uh, ran the GTP car ended up uh, doing the skip barber driving school and some other things started the BMW car collection from some old derelict cars that we found in a barn that they were going to throw away, including David Hobbs' 320 Turbo and the CSL and the Group 4 M1 that are in the collection today. Through the Hobbs uh, 320 we just sold, that was Henry Schmidt's car from BMW San Francisco, wasn't it? That was number three. Okay. The car we have is number two. Okay. And our collector friend, uh, the president of the BMW CCA Foundation, yeah. Lance White yes. owns chassis number one. Ah, yeah, that's so right. So there, there were only three, and NA still has car number two, which we restored yeah. and, and kept. That you found in a dusty barn. I did. <laughs> and uh, what what, uh, what was the favorite race car for you? What was your, I mean, you know. Of my whole career? Yeah, what did what, you enjoy? What car did you enjoy the most? I have to say, uh, probably the McLaren F1, because we well, got we got drawn into it as a favor to BMW Motorsport. They had helped us develop a new engine. You know, we did a different head for the E36 M3, yes. which at the time was very controversial. Yeah. But it allowed us to bring the car in at 35,000 as opposed to, uh, you know, let's call it 50,000. Yeah. And we attained some real volume success there. And that was the U.S. spec E36 M3. Correct, in 1995. Right. They did us a big favor in, in working through the problems on that project. When I started as the M brand manager, we were down to a couple of hundred M cars a year. And North America was considering getting out of M sales altogether. Yeah. By the time I left, we were doing almost 20,000 a year, 80% of worldwide volume. Which has kind of held the percentage proportion to this day almost. The, I mean, the volumes have gone down, but the proportions have stayed uh, much the same. I mean, North America, without question, is the leading majority of all M sales global. Um, so, my favorite car. Yes, yes. The McLaren F1 was a real opportunity. Munich needed some help. They didn't have the money to do a factory program. McLaren won Le Mans in 95, very unexpectedly with J.J. Leto driving 20 hours in the rain. It was complete surprise that they won. And McLaren got all the credit, which really angered uh, Karl Heinz Kopfel, the chairman of M. And we decided, they decided, they really wanted to do a factory program um, to give BMW um, the rightful credit. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we put a million dollars down, um, England and France put a million dollars down, and the deal was we could invite all our board and come to the race and uh, go to McLaren, see the cars being built, 
and then at the end of the race in 96, we got to keep the car. Yeah. So we very quickly made that deal. Uh, Vic Doolin, our president, said, they did us a favor, we'll do them a favor. We went, had a great time. I took all the American magazines over there with Danny Sullivan, who was our uh, chosen American driver. Mm -hmm. Went to their private test track, drove the car. They weren't gonna allow any of our journalists to drive the car, so I put my foot down and said, they have to drive the car. And they said, okay, then you take responsibility. So I said, all right. I sat in the right seat, and an engineer from McLaren sat in the left seat. <laughs> and I told all our guys, you make me uncomfortable for one minute, and I'm, my hand is on the key, and I'm shutting it off, and we are done. And these guys, a dozen of them, they drove like schoolgirls. You can't believe it. No guardrails, trees everywhere. They said, this is highly dangerous. And we didn't put a wheel wrong. We had a great day. I drove the car. Everybody drove the car. Danny Sullivan gets in the car. And he says, let me just have a few laps. I, I, I want to try this thing. I've never driven it. So he goes out, does a few laps, and he comes back into the pit lane. He says, Eric, you can't believe this. Jump in. So I jump in, and he says, this thing is unbelievable. He says, watch this. And he takes his foot away from the gas. It's just idling. Puts it in first gear, backs out the clutch. It had adjustable vanos both in and out. Yeah. So the thing would just pick up at idle and, and go down the pit lane. We're going 10, 15 miles an hour. He goes to second gear, no gas. We're just going 20, 30 miles an hour. Third, fourth, fifth. We're going down the pit lane at 60 miles an hour. He's yet to touch the gas pedal. And then he goes, watch this. And he buries the gas pedal. And it just goes, whoa, and takes off. And he goes, it's an eight liter Duesenberg. He said, this is unbelievable. <laughs> and he says, watch this. I'll make the front end wash out. And he makes the front end, he goes in hot, he makes the front end, well, feel this, feel this? I'm like, yeah, Danny, I feel it, I feel it. <laughs> and he goes, watch, I'll get on the gas and I'll put the tail out. And he puts the tail out left and right, he goes, do you feel that? Goes, yeah, I feel it, let's pull in now, I feel it. <laughs> and he said, this is gonna be a blast, we're gonna have a great time with this car. <laughs> so I get out of the car, I'm kinda pale, and everyone's going, how was it? And I'm going, oh, it was great, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that night. Nice. We go to the factory and we watch them being built. You know, it's white lab coats. It's it's as if you're in NASA watching them push together this car. I mean, the engine was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Like the exhaust system was thirty five thousand. We're doing that gold uh, plating. The gold, all from NASA, by the way. The gold heat sheathing in the in the engine bay, absolutely incredible. And, and for those that don't know, this is an eight fifty CSI engine with a different top end and all aluminum. Really incredible. Same displacement. Paul Rush's master stroke. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the joke yeah. was he hid expenses all over the company building the engine and developing it because they really wanted this project to go. As we pass the Zentrum. Yes. <laughs> Long story short, we get back, had a great trip to Le Mans. Um, we, we went to Silverstone and, and raced the car. And. Uh, we ran at Le Mans, I think we ran 7th or 8th, and we weren't really a factor in the race, the Porsches killed us. Uh -huh. But we had a great time, took a helicopter over the race in the evening, uh, had, a, had a fantastic experience, met all the drivers. And uh, at the end of the day, we come back to New Jersey, and the car comes back a month or two later, all cleaned up, and all the decals on it, tech sticker, everything. And uh, Vic Doolin walks into my office and said, okay, uh, I want you to go sell the McLaren, get rid of it. And I had no intention of selling it. I knew exactly what it would be. And uh, at the, I, I hid the car in our collection of other cars. I showed it to no one. How do you hide a McLaren F1? You put it in the middle of a lot of other cars <laughs> and people don't really know what they're looking at. Did you hide the keys? Uh, no, <laughs> the key was in it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> So uh, six months later, he sees me in the hallway and he says, Eric, uh, this is our president. Very tough guy. He says, Eric, uh, how's it going selling the McLaren? And I said, oh, Vic, he said, it's, it's an old race car. It's yesterday's news. No one's really interested in it. And I said, the price, we, we couldn't get 750 for it. I said, I don't want to give it away. And he said, we really haven't had much interest at all. And he looked at me and he shook his head and he said, you're not going to sell it, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, I knew it. He said, I already told the board he's not going to sell it. You watch. 
and he walked away. He says, it doesn't matter. I think the accountants wrote it off already anyway. And I looked at my colleague and I said, well, he didn't fire me. So today that car, they, by the way, the Europeans sold theirs immediately for seven hundred and fifty or eight hundred thousand dollars. Today that car is valued at over twenty million and they couldn't buy it back if they wanted to. So I consider that my gift to BMW of North America. Yeah, I think that uh, that helped uh, uh, pay your way a bit, didn't it? Not long term. And that was so. That was uh, that was that conversation took place probably in 97? 96, 97. And so that time simultaneously, you were doing the 36 racing program. Yes. Working with PTG and Tom Milner. Yep. We had gone through the lightweight, the M3 lightweight exercise. That was another story. But yeah. we we got two used E36 cars from Motorsport. Uh, they were they were lightweight. Uh, uh, supposedly, actually, right. not that lightweight. Mm -hmm. So we we started development on them. We hired Tom Milner, and very uh, quickly. Th this is the early version. This yep. is the pre pre prototype. Yeah. Well, no, no. This is this is actually '95. We bought two used cars in Europe because okay. they were running them. Okay. And we were able to get them cheaply. And I had asked for a proper budget to do a race team for quite a while. Uh -huh. And they turned me down every year. It got to the point where they would turn me at the board meeting. They would turn me at the door and say, we can't deal with that this year, Eric. We don't have the money. Come back next year. So we thought the E36 platform was that good. We had to make a major statement in American IMSA racing and stay there. BMW had a real history of getting in and getting out, yeah. getting in, getting out. And people like Porsche used to just eat our lunch because they are in there working on their program all the time. Yeah, 24 7. The right people, the right drivers, the right development. And it takes a long time to get up on the wheel and really make your package competitive. So I walked in there and I said, look, I'll make it very easy for you. Give me half the money we're looking for and I will raise the other half outside the company. Mm -hmm. So they gladly took that deal and we went out and got sponsorship from Valvoline. We got sponsorship from a bank. We did a lot of other things. And uh, of course, I did not raise enough money. And then what happened? You want to keep them? Yeah, yeah, let's we'll keep going straight. Um, I went to my boss in March or April of that year. And I said, uh, I said, uh, what was he telling us to do? He wanted me to go over there. It's okay. Okay. I told my boss, uh, I've got a, something to talk to you about. And I said, I hate to tell you. You want to go in? Yeah, I guess we'll pull in. I said, we're going to go badly over budget here. And I wanted to give you all the warning I could. And he said, uh, okay. And I said, we're going to go a million dollars over budget. And he said, oh, that's very serious. And I said, well, look. Um, we're going to park us up front because it's an M1. Okay. You're good. Okay, so we've had a quick driver change. We've now parked or we're parking uh, at our event. And uh, so let's see, we're talking E36 M3. Curb here. Yes. Um, so we're talking E36 racing program. And... Uh, where were we at? We were just getting our feet underneath us in the early days, and uh, we had some fun, we had some success, and we began to think we could start to win races. And we met a guy named Bill Oberlin in New Orleans in 1995, racing around the Super Bowl down through the streets, the Super Dome in New Orleans. And uh, he beat us with a Mazda. Uh -huh and then uh, privately entered Mazda, and then he crashed that, trying to out-qualify us. And uh, he jumped in a Porsche 911 that belonged to a friend and took the pole away from us again. <laughs> so I said to Tom Milner, I don't know who this kid is. Ralph, I'm back you going, hello, sir. Hey, buddy, how are you? Whoa, whoa. Yep. Um, last time I saw you, you were kneeling down next to a Ferrari. Remember that photo? Yes. Whoa, whoa. I see it. Oh, she needs an inch, baby. Okay. So, Bill Oberlin. Is so we had dinner with him, and we hired him uh, on the spot for the next season. And 23 years later, he's the tied for the most wins in IMSA history. <laughs> Which we had a little fun with him yesterday. Right. 
and at the end, uh, you know, he's gonna he has more BMW victories worldwide than any other BMW Go driver. By two feet. So, uh, nice yeah, thank you. I'm glad you did that and not me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just a couple inches. Yeah, just you were tight quarters. So, uh, Bill is now tied 60 wins with yeah. Scott Pruitt. And I think it's almost a foregone conclusion that they're going to get that record next season. And it's a terrific testament to his ability and a terrific testament to uh, BMW as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a really long partnership. It is. 23 years is unheard of in, in any sort of professional racing. And he's obviously still at the top of his game. Yes, even though he wears glasses. I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> we can joke with him about that, but he's, yeah. he's actually uh, he's as fast as he ever was. And he's probably the most mechanically aware and sympathetic drivers. Um, I worked with uh, more than 100 pros from Danny Sullivan and David Hobbs and uh, Tom John Watson all, all the way down to um, Quester oh, and oh yeah Dieter Quester a David wide Donahue. variety David Donahue John Paul Jr. John Paul Jr. Hans Stuck you name it <laughs> um, Bill has got a unique sensibility uh, he used to wrench his own car he's German his father worked on his own cars and uh, he did 10 years of tire testing with Yokohama and the guy has got an incredible sense not only how to make the car faster, but you heard stories last night about different compound tires and mm -hmm. on the left side and right side. No one had ever done that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is incredibly talented. Yeah, he told me a story about when his dad had started finally um, you know, doing somewhat well in business, but still cars were relatively inexpensive and, and dad had an M1, like the one we're sitting in, and took Bill, young, young Bill, for a ride in M1. Well, his dad has had a lot of cars. He, Gary is a really nice guy. In my era, we hired him as the uh, team photographer, so he would come to us, w with us uh, to all the races and take all the pictures. And he was very good. He's a very good photographer, but a really, really nice guy, and he's still around. I mean, he's uh, he's very active and a very nice uh, family. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Bill is... Uh well, we did a, about a thousand foot burnout yesterday in the, the new uh, M8, uh, all new M8. I, I think it's been broken in mileage wise, yeah, that, uh, I, I think. At this point. Well, it is now. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we put put a nice little video for our uh, YouTube uh, family there. Excellent. Um, well, we've got to get this talk going uh, with Haggerty, and um, it's going to be kind of fun. The five BMWs to watch, which we're going to probably go off script and talk about five completely different cars. Probably. Sure, that, that's okay. But yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, thanks for tuning in for a nice little uh, impromptu jam session of EAG Unscripted with good old Eric Wensberg. Thanks for uh, agreeing to do this with us, man. Happy to do it. I'm, I'm My looking, pleasure. Looking forward to spending the rest of the day with all these uh, great BMW enthusiasts. And uh, uh, subscribe for more. we got a lot more cool guys uh, and content coming up. Uh, we're very blessed to, to be friends with you know, guys like you that have helped. And I mean, this guy's been an amazing resource for information for us. I mean, for what, maybe 10 years we've been talking yep. about stuff. Yep. And uh, he's got all the VINs for this, that, the other. And, and uh, you know, an M1, I mean, you're an M1's, you know, whisper. You've got the uh, M1 Pro car that 33 years now you've owned and eventually you'll drive it. That's right. That's, <laughs> but, uh, that's what they say. But, but you know, this hopefully uh, got and you a little fix. This uh, was good fun. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for more. See, See ya. ya.